Um, we're going to start with open banking uh, and look at how tech companies and banks are interacting with each other in that space. And to kick off the first session, we're going to have a, a short spotlight on Ripple, the global settlement network. Now, Ripple is uh, now working with over 30% of the top global banks, offering an impressive 33% reduction in operating costs for international payments. And here to tell us uh, about the implications of open banking for international payments, please welcome to the stage the managing Director for Europe of Ripple, Danny Aranda. Uh, is my mic working? Just doing a quick sound check here. Thumbs up? Great, thank you. Um, so thank you for having us, uh, Innovate Finance. We're really happy to be here. I'm Danny Aranda, MD for Europe at Ripple. Um, I moved out to London about a year ago from a headquarters in San Francisco because a lot of the activity that we were seeing in the UK and in Europe in particular what, what was, was really heating up and we wanted to make sure that we we're building an adequate second home here. Um, the presentation I'm going to walk through uh, just describes at a high level our view on the market and what we really see as uh, the opportunity, um, both within the blockchain space but within the banking space more broadly. So I, I would say um, the first thing we want to focus on is I think a lot of times when you think about blockchain, you think about technologies enabling new opportunities. Um, but we want to maybe take the opposite approach to say that uh, technologies are typically just the foundations to allow for certain things to happen, um, but that the driving force, the demand for those kinds of capabilities really need to come from the market. So w what are we seeing in the market today in terms of new demands for types of transactions and, and types of financial services? If you look at the really fast-growing companies, the really fast-growing corporates, these are businesses that are relatively categorically different to businesses that exist before. So if you think about companies like Uber, Airbnb, Alibaba, Facebook, these are more platform companies. They bring together two sides of an equation in order to transact. And a lot of these companies were online from day one. They're global as well, so if you get an Airbnb uh, a house, you could be someone traveling from the UK over into Brazil. Um, and they just have new kinds of needs, new kinds of demands. So a, a good example of that is someone like Uber. Uber needs to move $10 from a bank account in San Francisco over to the mobile phone account of a driver in India. And they want to be able to do that in real time or else they're going to lose that driver. That's a really different kind of need than, say, Shell has or some of your more traditional corporations. And largely what we're seeing is this move from a world where it's acceptable to move large amounts of money in bulk in batch processes to a world where things need to be more on demand, more immediate, and actually need to support very, very small, tiny amounts moving around the world. So in terms of um, what we see as the problem today is that uh, the current financial infrastructure for the way that we do transactions really wasn't built for these kinds of use cases. It was built for a more batch process world. And so what this has done is it's increased some of the costs around doing some of these lower value transactions, it introduces a lot of risk in terms of how it moves across multiple counterparties, and introduces delays as well. So your typical wire, say, takes a, a day to, to three days to actually settle. And I think um, what blockchain really inspired was a way to look at a more uh, internet style approach for the fundamentals of what happens in the infrastructure. And that's really exciting because if you think about FinTech overall over the past 20 years, a lot of the focus has been at the application layers. So think about PayPal or, uh, or Venmo or uh, TransferWise, these are companies who produced a better product experience for doing certain kinds of things online, certain kinds of financial services. If you read PayPal's annual statements, the way that they articulate themselves is that they have taken the existing financial infrastructure and they make it work for a digital connected consumer. They're essentially simulating an online experience, what it would be like to transact, but still using the same pipes, the same plumbing, underneath, and what blockchain really introduced was uh, a new kind of plumbing. How can we actually connect uh, different sources of value around the world? 
Our point of view, though, is that blockchain is ultimately just a new kind of database. It's a decentralized, distributed database. It works uh, by some you know, very uh, transparent um, uh, rules that can be open source. These are very interesting dynamics. But we don't think it's necessarily feasible to put the entire world on a single database. If you think about the internet, that's not the way the internet works. We don't access one da database when we access the internet. That's a very kind of AOL-like view of the world. Rather, it's all about interoperability between systems, and this is what we're beginning to think about at Ripple in terms of thinking about what's next after blockchain. So if we think about different systems of value that allow us to, to move funds today, we largely view blockchain, Bitcoin, Ripple, Ethereum as being kind of one of these types of databases. And that really what we want to do is create open standards, use some of the cryptographic techniques inspired by blockchain to begin to connect these different systems and allow them to interoperate, allow for funds to move seamlessly across borders and across different national systems like FPS over into ACH in the US. There's also the question of cryptocurrency. Where, where, where does this really fit in? How, how does it really help this overall picture? And we actually think it has a very important role to play that cryptocurrency would allow for liquidity to be managed in a more efficient way between these different systems. And we can begin to see some of the demands of these new corporates, the Airbnbs and the Uber that we were referencing earlier, uh, be serviced in a more efficient way, where you can actually bring down settlement times. You can reduce the cost of liquidity to the point where it actually makes it economically viable to move $2 from a bank account in San Francisco to a mobile phone account over in India. So in terms of what we're trying to do with blockchain, we at Ripple are beginning with payments. We're specifically starting with uh, cross-border payments. And one reason why we're doing this is, I would say the main one is that we feel like it solves a problem today. But two is payments are highly strategic. If you look at a lot of FinTech companies, there's a reason that you see kind of an outsized focus on payments, and it's because payments is the connective tissue for a lot of financial services ecosystems. If you think about lending, security settlement, a lot of capital markets, a lot of these services are actually rendered uh, via a payment. The actual execution of them happens in that payment. So if we feel that we've provided a good foundation on the payment side in terms of inter-networking between different systems and allowing value to flow, we feel like we've provided the good foundation for a lot of other next generation services to build new kinds of applications. So Going back to that kind of PayPal example, if you change the underlying plumbing and pipes underneath an application like PayPal, that could create new kinds of applications, new kinds of PayPals that we currently can't imagine. So if you think about the internet itself, this kind of new uh, data and information communication network, it's really hard at the beginning of the internet to imagine a company like Google or imagine a company like Facebook. And we think we're at a similar time right now around blockchain. If we can reimagine some of this plumbing, we're going to introduce all kinds of new applications uh, that we're going to see as consumers, as businesses, that are going to change our lives just as much as the internet has. That's all. Thank you very much. Danny, thank you very much indeed. Well, it's uh, now my pleasure to uh, welcome onto the stage the moderator for the next session. He and his panel are going to look at the impact of uh, open banking on financial institutions and what that means for consumer services. He's a director of innovation at, Con at Consult uh, and an internationally recognized thought leader in the digital money. Please welcome onto the stage Dave Birch. Now, in this session, we're going to talk about uh, open banking. Oh, that's, that's me. Um, I'm better at Twitter than some of the other people in here. That's what that says. Yeah, we'll just go around and do it. Uh, <clears throat> I want to make one quick point before, before I dive into the fintech pit here, which is the people that we work for um, are, are, by and large, not the little fintech startups. So I have a great interest in fintech, but I have a mercenary interest in fintech from our clients' perspectives. And, uh, and as you'll see, we work for the sort of larger players in this game. So what, what I'm interested in is what fintech can offer. You know, I'm a little bit skeptical of the, I mean, you can boo me off stage if you like, but you know, fintech's gonna overthrow the banks and whatever, and 
you know, Bitcoin's going to get rid of the Bank of England and so on. I mean, you can just park that for the next hour or so because we're talking more realistically about how banks and fintechs can work together. And the mechanism for banks and fintechs working together is open banking. Now, because I come from the more uh, tech end of the spectrum, so to many people in the room, open banking is just a sort of random waffle word. It doesn't really mean anything. It's like blockchain or cloud or something like that. Um, but to me, open banking means something very specific, and that's all to do with APIs. Open banking as in, right, we're going to actually open up the banking infrastructure so fintechs and others can connect to it. So for me, open banking is a specific discussion about these APIs and what people are going to do with them once they're opened up. And I thought I would, I would, um, I mean, I know the, uh, the, the regulations from, um, oh, what's the, you know, that, that thing we used to do, the, um, what's it called, European Union. Those things don't apply to us for too much longer, but the European Directive on Management Consulting is still in force. So I'm afraid I have no choice but to present a two by two matrix to you. It's, it's the law. There's nothing I can do about it. So I thought a useful way of structuring the discussion, rather than just talk about APIs in general, I think you know, we need to sort of break it down a little bit. And, and I think, uh, hopefully, you'll see this is a useful way of structuring it. So this is, this is how we do it with our clients. So first of all, you need to think about there are going to be mandatory and non-mandatory APIs. So there's going to be APIs that the banks have to put into place. Well, when I, when I say bank, I mean, applica I mean you know, account servicing, payment services provider. So, so no, because the ASPSP can interface to the TTP through the AISP or PISP, RTS. You're not writing this down. What's? <laughs> You're never going to pass the test on this stuff. Look, OK, I'm going to say bank for shorthand, but we all know I really mean ASPSP. So, so uh, there's mandatory and non-mandatory. So in other words, there's, there's things that the banks are going to be made to do Right? And there are things that the banks might want to do in order to obtain some sort of positioning or, or competitive advantage in this space. There's mandatory and non-mandatory. And then I divided them into payment and non-payment as another way of thinking about this. And, and if you look at the way those things kind of map out, I mean, you know, broadly speaking, you can see different kinds of competition and cooperation in each category. So, the thing that most of us are really focused on right now because of PSD2 and the timescales, and I'm sure you've all read the regulatory technical standards uh, about this, and we're all looking at the timescales. So we're very focused on, on that bottom left corner. But from a business point of view, it's not obvious how banks are going to make any money out of that. Because here you're talking about mandatory stuff. Everybody has to implement it. Transaction fees are asymptotic to zero if they're not zero already. And if you try to charge for anything in this, pay, people just go to somebody else straight away. So here's stuff we have to do, but it's not obvious how to make money out of it. Then we've got stuff that we don't have to do, but we might want to do anyway because we think that gives us an advantage. So if, if, you know, if, you were, if the bank has some special capabilities in... Uh, pff, I don't know, whatever it is banks do, trade finance, LIBOR fixing, whatever it is. We have an API for that sort of thing, and that's non-mandatory, right? Uh, but we might still want to do it. Maybe we can, maybe if we're good at something in that space, maybe we can charge for something there. Up the top, we have the non-payment APIs, which in the UK, specifically, is a slightly different fr from, from, in other European countries, people are looking at the PSD2 AISP APIs, and those should be broadly congruent with the UK's special case, which is the Open Banking Working Group information APIs, which come out of a different, you know, they, they come from the Competition and Markets Authority and the remedies and all those other things, but obviously it would be stupid to have two completely separate lots of APIs. So broadly speaking, we would imagine that the non-payment mandatory APIs would be roughly the same and they might well Converge. Again, it's not obvious how to make a lot of money out of that because everybody will have to do it and they'll all do very similar things. And, and um, some of them are quite boring. So, for example, if you go to GitHub and look at the APIs 
right now. It's best not to do that before bedtime, in my opinion. But if you go and have a quick glance through it, uh, what you'll see is those account, those kind of information APIs are, you know, like ATM locators and stuff like that. I mean, it's, how can you make a living out of this? I'm not sure, but the, the panel are going to tell us. And then in the top right-hand corner, you've got the non-mandatory, non-payment APIs. And this is where I, you know, my biases are very clear because I think personally, if the banks are going to make a living out of any of this stuff, then looking towards payments to do it probably isn't, uh, you know, a great idea. There's not a lot of money in that sort of thing. Um, and it works well, cross-border, obviously, for people like Santander and so on. But like if the average bank you know, trying to make money out of this when everyone else is doing the same thing, pff, hard. So we look towards the non-payment stuff, and because we want to differentiate and maybe do something uh, either uh, for banks individually, or I, th I think more likely for, for banks forming their own platform, we probably want to look more into the non-mandatory, non-payment APIs. And there are a few different candidates for stuff in that area. Uh, again, I tend to think, uh, and you know, if you look statistically at the kind of work we're doing with clients, um, there are things like identification, authentication, authorization that are up in this corner, which uh, it's more plausible that banks could form a differentiated service and make a bit of money in that space. So, so a couple of things I want you to take away from this. So first of all, because I come from the tech side, open banking isn't a waffle thing to me. It means something very specific about opening up these APIs and what's going to happen then. And secondly, it's not an undifferentiated mass of APIs. They're like, there's different ways of thinking about these APIs and grouping them. We're going to use that in some of the discussion. So we've decided to sort of break with tradition and have an expert panel that has some expert panel, has some actual experts. And I saw them earlier on. They were around somewhere. So could I ask, could I ask the crowds of adoring fans to part for a moment, please? Um, and somewhere we have Luke Griffiths, who's the general manager of Klarna, Alan Lockhart from Open Banking and FinTech at RBS, Celine Lathort from uh, MangoPay, she's here too, I saw her earlier on, Simon Toms from Allen and Overy. Do we have a mandatory? We don't have a lawyer. Did he wimp out at the last minute? That's pathetic. That is absolutely pathetic. This is lawyers. This is why I'm happy they're going to be replaced by the blockchain and AI, because I don't care about them. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Nick White from Monetize. Nick, I saw him earlier on. Please come on up. That's great. Thanks very much. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to broadly explain to you uh, in just a couple of minutes why, why you're interested in this stuff. Don't, don't go over what it is yet, but just say why it is, from your organization's perspective, why it is you're interested in this. So let's start down the end. So Nick, why do you care about any of this stuff? Well, I care about it because I see it... Um as an opportunity for banks to accelerate the pace of change. And why um, would they want to do that? Well, at the end of the day, if you don't do it, how are you going to satisfy the growing demands of, uh, of your consumers? Or by uh, being a regulated financial institution and making it illegal for everybody else to do it. Well, <laughs> well look, I, I believe in the power of the customer, right? The customer has got to be at the centre of everything that the bank does and therefore they need to be leading with innovative customer-centric services. Um, and the pace of change innovation needs to, needs to be quicker. We keep doing this. Celine, why do you care about any of this stuff? Well, I share the, the, the point of Nick. I mean, uh, my perspective is only the consumer and uh, both the company I created. Uh, it was just because I understand there was a need and no one was filling it and filling the gap. Uh, we've been acquired by a bank 18 months ago, so I'm just trying you know, to stay as the fintech mind and fintech startup and not uh, switch to the banker mood. So, so uh, but you would say you're broadly, you're broadly speaking, yours is a bank perspective now, right? Now you're being made to open up. Oh, I hope I'm still a fintech and, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, and trying to bring them the vision. But uh, um, it's hard to see that even a bank, they doesn't know what is an API. You're talking about an API, but they don't know what is it. I had uh, um, uh, kind of difficulties to explain that MongoPay is an You're API. You're making that yeah. up. That's not true. All banks know what APIs are, um, don't they? Alan? Um, she's exaggerating. Uh, no, she's absolutely Damn. not. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's been one of the interesting things that we've needed to do is to explain to uh, traditional banking uh, folks what an API is and why, why we should care. Um, 
But the net net is for us is we see it as a hugely positive thing because it's going to open up our digital doors and bring in lots and lots of fintechs that will target niches that a large bank such as RBS NatWest could never address even if they wanted to. So overall, we see it as a really positive move. Excellent stuff. You see, Luke, you seem to be, to me, you seem to be one of the companies that's going to benefit from this. So is it redundant of me to say, why are you interested in this? Because you're going to make money out of it, right? We are. That's yeah. That's the intention. So, uh, we're, we're we actually come from it um, from an interesting perspective in that we are we're a regulated bank in Sweden, uh, so we have all of the compliance controls uh, around lending money. Uh, we're also a fintech, so uh, you know we have uh, open APIs that we're integrating in with retailers to, to make um, lending decisions for consumers who are uh, making transactions. We come from a you know, very customer-centric perspective. Um, so we're interested in how we can actually get access to more data to make better, more informed lending decisions. Um, so from that perspective, you know, we, we see this as a, an opportunity to work both ways, both to enrich um, our business um, and to in, uh, enrich uh, financial lending for the consumer as well. Okay, so just, just so people in the audience understand what open banking is going to mean, I just, if we think forward a few months or years or whenever the PSD2 thing, what is that, next year or something or the year after or, or at some so. unspecified point in the future, what's actually going to happen, that means third parties will be able to have access to your bank account through these APIs, right? And the regulation is quite specific. There's has no contractual arrangement. So, so uh, I'll get an email from Klarna, which says, uh, by the way, do you mind if we snoop around in your bank account for these very good reasons, which uh, will all be protected by data protection and so on. And then you click OK, and from then on, Klarna can have a look around in your bank account and see what you're up to. And that's broadly speaking what's going to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and now, no. uh, broadly, broadly speaking, and, and Objects, you're, you're obje happy with this. Objection, Your Honour. Yeah, um, that's absolute nonsense, and um, <laughs> you know it. Um, but what will happen is, is that banks will be obligated to provide access um, to third parties, but what will happen is that third party needs to get the customer, the end customer, to authenticate with the bank, with the institution, whoever that is. And so it's not a case, as you know, um, of just providing you know, open access to all accounts. It will be on a case-by-case -case basis, and the customer is going to authorize it. And the customer can also you know, effectively reject that at any point as well. Yeah, no, he's going to give me permission. So I'll get an email from Klarna which says, can we have a look around your bank account? I click OK. Of course I have to authenticate. Yeah. No, no, I know that. Um, and. Uh, and Nick, so what is this? What effect is this going to have for the fintech? So this is great, right? This means any of yeah. you guys can now start looking around at her customers' personal financial details, right? Well, I think what's interesting right off the bat is that we're using words like "what do I have to do?" "what should I do?" Um, and that, that to me suggests that all we're talking about is compliance with a mandate and a regulation, rather than thinking about. What could we do? What are the exciting new ideas and new experiences that could be enabled by open banking? And that doesn't necessarily have to be just a threat to the bank. What can a bank do with its competitors' APIs to create new experiences? What, as well as what can the fintechs do with those APIs? But the problem is that if you're a bank and you want to make the most out of the accessibility of the, these new APIs from your competitors, you need to increase the pace of change. You need to be able to move quicker and move as fast as these new, new fintechs. And so we have to not only think about compliance with a, an API standard, but think about the digital transformation that's going to be needed by the incumbent banks to increase the pace of change, reduce the cost of change, so that they can meet the expectations of their customers, which are only rising uh, as a result of all of these new ideas that are coming from outside of the banks. Yeah, so we, we talk about third parties accessing bank accounts, but it's actually other banks accessing bank accounts, isn't it? So, 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 so what, what kinds of organizations do you think will want to see your customers' data? Well, the obvious starting point is the comparison services. So you know, they are already looking at how they can take an aggregated view across your portfolio of financial products to help make you, the customer, uh, have more informed decisions around what are the right products for you. But again, it's not then just about that first stage of, well, let's have a look at your product 
uh, portfolio and let's have a look at what's right for you, they have to add to that other parts of the customer experience. For example, how could I then open that product in a seamless way through a digital channel? And so more often than not, what you're going to need is a combination of the open banking APIs with other APIs to create fantastic customer experiences. It won't be enough just to use the things that are mandatory. Okay, but Celine, just, just, to, just to illustrate the kind of thing that that means is, so what happens is, so something like Money Supermarket, I'll go to Money Supermarket. Money Supermarket will say, can I have a look at all of your bank accounts? I say, okay, and then it comes back and says, oh, you shouldn't be with NatWest, you should be with Santander, or that's good for customers, right? Well, it won't necessarily just be about... No, I was asking Celine. Oh, sorry. No, no, but... Uh, he doesn't know what's good for customers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. The thing is that uh, you want to provide a seamless experience. Um, you are buying and buying online, so the more you can do, the better it is for the customers. Uh, for me, the big challenge for the banks, it's not fintech, it's gaffas. I mean, once you have this kind of opportunity on Facebook, then you can shop online, you can see and have access directly from Facebook to your bank accounts. You don't even go again on your uh, banking website because you can have all the information from your, uh, your Facebook accounts. Oh, no. So that's a good point, right? Because we were thinking that nice people like Luke will be accessing our bank mm -hmm. accounts. But actually, for most people in the country, they'll get an email from Google or Facebook or Amazon that says, actually, we don't want to bother those nice people at Visa and MasterCard because they're jolly busy processing all their transactions and things like that. So why don't you just let us have access to your bank account? And like if it's Amazon, I would. And they'll say, oh, and you can have an extra film every month or something if you do that. So, so actually, for most people, it isn't going to be exciting fintechs that are doing this, is it, really? It's going to be the massive internet giants who are going to step in and form a layer between customers and banks, right? Is this an inevitable outcome? You're supposed to say no and, and <laughs> be enthusiastic for these people out well, here. I, I think the fintechs are... So let's tr the, we'll try that one again, okay? Is it... Uh, is it, they were very distracted in the rehearsal, so we just try that one more time. So, is this an inevitable outcome? No. Thank no. you. <laughs> You're wrong, but come up with a few. Come up well, with look. a few reasons as to why. Why? Come up with one plausible reason why 90% of the population won't do all of their banking inside Snap, Gram, Chat, or whatever it is they use now. Well, look. Let's start with the. The, the pragmatic starting point is that despite all the efforts so far, switching is still at historically low levels. What? Um, we spent a billion quid on that account switching system, didn't we? It's still... Whose idea was that? Anyone? In the <laughs> <laughs> right, so the, so the incumbent banks uh, uh, benefit from some degree of inertia. I also believe that the banks will get to a point, if they make the right decisions around platforms and processes and cultural change, that they can start to act more like some of the, uh, the, the gaffers uh, out there. If they don't, then they have a problem. But I believe that they're going to have to find new ways of working, change their culture, change their processes, adopt different platforms to start innovating at speed. Now, I do, I, you can't ignore those guys there, right? So uh, let's look at Apple Pay. You know, in 2015, at Christmas, I saw three TV adverts with banks advertising Apple Pay. Effectively, the double agent is in the room hijacking their customer relationships, and they put it on TV. But it's because they weren't ahead of the innovation curve, and they felt like they needed to benefit from that halo effect that they, they, they get for, from engaging someone like Apple. So, they've, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22, right? You can't ignore the threat. Can I just ask Luke, so in, in an advanced nation, people don't use credit cards to buy things, do they? They use other ways to pay? No, not in Sweden, they right. don't know. They use Klarna. I thought so. <laughs> and so, for most people, they already give you access to their bank account, don't they? Um, so, uh, I guess they, to a degree, they do, but they, it's about building the trust with the consumer. And ultimately, um, you know, the likes of Amazon or Google, um, you know, they're... They're focused on developing solutions which are customer-centric and focused on um, how they can add better value to the, to the customer. I think that's the challenge for the, for the banks, is that it really becomes a cultural change that they need to go through. They need to uh, you know, move away from uh, legacy infrastructure that can really inhibit their ability to, to innovate and to develop uh, solutions which are 
uh, meeting customer expectations and needs and, and create some you know, different type of uh, solutions for, for those customers. And that's what Amazon are really good at. But isn't it also a viable strategy for, for the bank, Alan, just to make the best possible API, the most responsive, the most efficient, the most... Pro and actually, you know, why not let Snapgram chat do the customer interface? Why, why should the bank want to do it? So I think there's two, two levels that this discussion needs to happen at, right? One is this API layer, right? And we are competing there, or we will in the future be competing, I guess, for a new customer set, which is those that will build applications. And so we want to have the richest set of APIs yeah. for them. So that's, that's one level of competition. And we need to target, act like technology companies and target uh, fintechs and yeah. so on. But there's another level, and I think really the discussion needs to be raised to that. Everyone wants to talk about the API economy, but, but really, as you know, it's the app economy that's going to sit on top of that, that goes that last mile to the customer that owns the customer experience is where the really interesting thing will be. And so whether it is the GAFAs competing there, or fintechs, PFM providers, and so on, whoever that is, that is where the huge opportunity is, I believe, in the future to really win customer trust. Because they don't, I don't imagine that any consumer is going to want all of their financial information all spread all over the internet with all of these different companies. But they will, they will do what they've always done, which is trust um, their financial institution. Was the, 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 I know we made a joke of it, but <coughs> the current account switching service is a demonstration of that capability. I'll make just one more point. And that is, whilst we've seen a huge inertia and reticence for customers to move bank institutions, I think the um, app chat generation, Facebook generation, have demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate a tremendous willingness to shop around in terms of what that app is to access their financial stuff. And so, so you're going to see that what's the cool thing, and particularly the younger generation will move very quickly, but I, I don't believe, we don't, we don't think, they're going to fundamentally be changing their financial institution where their money is held with the same kind of degree uh, of change. So when, uh, he's got a point there, hasn't he, Salim? Because, because if it is at that kind of app level, then actually, I mean, for example, my bank's app, I won't say which bank I'm with, but my bank's app, works fine. I'm perfectly happy with it. I mean, it does all the things I, I can look at my account and send money and whatever. So for dreary old people like me, you know, the fact that I can do it in Snap, whatever, I don't really care. But for that next generation, it is a much more app-centric vision, isn't it? Well, I think there is both the, the vision. I mean, um, I don't say banks would die in a couple of years and uh, fintech will rule the world. I think it's more a balanced question. But it's also a question of mood and culture. So I'll give you a small example. A um, couple of years ago, um, so Litchi, the first company I created, is an online platform to collect money from your friends, uh, for example, for a group birthday gift, uh, for a charity, so any kind of purpose where you want to collect money online. Uh, a very a well known French bank, I'm not going to disclaim the name, said, OK, we're going to do the same as Litchi and goodbye, Celine. And they copycat uh, Litchi. Uh, but in their vision, of course, they let only the people from the bank paying on the money pool. So if you were outside of the bank, you couldn't pay. And I asked them, but it's stupid. I mean, if you do a group birthday gift, you don't want to do it with only the friends who have the same bank as you. But their vision was, well, why would we? provide a service to someone that is not our customer. So that's for me the real thing. It's do you have a platform vision? Do you have a customer vision? Do you have a user vision? And at the end, this is the thing for me banks have to move on. It's to change the vision or they see their customers. And of course, if they move on this and if they um, integrate people who are more than my generation and can bring this kind of vision, then the battle is not the question of the API. The battle is about how do you serve your customer. But does this take us to a point where, I mean, I'm asking all of you this now, because, but does this take us to a point where the customer, like, for example, if you buy, I'm thinking about Amazon, right? So if you buy a Kindle with, with 3G or 4G or whatever it is, you buy, you buy Kindle with the, uh, you have literally no idea, is it Vodafone in the UK? I can't remember, actually. So you have no idea which network is actually provided. You just buy the Kindle and you read the books and how it actually connects to anything. You don't really care, right? So aren't we moving towards a situation because of these changes where the customer will be in, in Facebook 
Facebook says, oh, I see you're 16. Would you like a bank account now? And you click OK. And now you've got your bank account and you can do it. And you have literally no idea what actual bank is sitting behind that. And you don't really care. I mean, it's, it's, isn't that the, the end point of this app economy that you're talking about? I, I actually think that they do still care. There was some recent research at the end of last year where the, you know, the much sought after millennials were actually a lot more conservative than we give them credit for in terms of be, caring about where their money is and whether that is in a safe and secure place. Um, but I do also accept the... <laughs> Have you ever met any? I've got two in the house. Have you ever met any of them? It's like, <laughs> I can't, you shouldn't I, take I can't this seriously. The, They'll tick anything. I can't tell you the amount of um, disagreements we've had about this, but it was a sample of 2,000 millennials. Um, and yes, they, you know, they, they do aspire for a great customer experience, to have an impact, to do worthy things. Oh, um, but they still... Uh, are more conservative in the UK than we give them credit for. That's true, isn't it, yeah. Alan? I, I, I just want to make an important point here, because when in your little example there, you segued kind of, I don't know if it was deliberately, surreptitiously or what, but you segued from buying books to opening a bank account, right? And those are two fundamentally different things, right? Now, we all understand that we're world, moving into a world where um, we want the payment mechanism to be frictionless. The customer doesn't care. He just wants it. We want to know uh, he or she wants it to be the right amount, and pay it. That's it. They don't want to get involved in that. And Uber is a, is a tremendous demonstration of the way the world is going in that. And that's going to happen. Right? I think that's a fundamentally different thing from I'm opening my relationship now with my financial institution, which I, I will probably have for life, you know, if past is, is, is a predictor of the future. And that's a different thing. And I think that's where, that's where banks, financial institutions, will, will compete in value and cost and so on. I think those are two fundamentally different things. No, he's got a point there, hasn't he? Because, I mean, people hate banks, broadly speaking, but they do trust them not to lose their money and all this sort of stuff, right? So, actually, people are quite conservative about this sort of thing. But I would suggest that I think millennials they are no longer in a one-to-one -one relationship. They are in a multiple relationship. It means they will open a bank account on Revolut to travel, but they will keep their bank account with RBS, for example, for their day-to-day -day, uh, income. Where my mother, she has one bank and she trusted it because uh, they gave her a loan 40 years ago. So I think this is the difference, that they're not going to have only one relationship with one bank institution or one relationship in generally speaking. Now, um, so that leads me into my next, so kind of, because I'm trying to think where this stuff goes, because at the moment we're obsessed with the implementation of it, but I'm trying to illustrate for the people here what, what the trajectory is, where this, this might go. So we have a situation where there'll be different categories of people that will be accessing the bank. I mean, you haven't mentioned retailers, for example. I mean, in the UK, people trust the big retailers. They have expectations of redress, which mean if Tesco said, let's not bother with Visa and MasterCard anymore. We'll just access your bank account. Oh, and by the way, you get double club card points. Most people would say yes. They trust Tesco for this sort of thing. So we didn't mention retailers, for example. But there's different categories. There's the internet giants. There's retailers. There's other banks, as was pointed out earlier on. There's going to be all these different groups that can access. But we're imagining them accessing in our sort of current mode of using things, which is me accessing my bank. Whereas, in reality, it's going to be some bots that are controlled by me talking to some bots that are controlled by the bank, I hope, uh, or bots controlled by other people's toasters or whatever is going on out there. The nature of competition is going to change in that space, isn't it? I mean, you alluded to it, Alan, when you said about building out the APIs. For banks that have historically competed for customers, and you can influence customers by having cute adverts on television and people singing and, uh, what's that, Lloyd's or is that? You, you know, all those people singing around things. So you can influence me for that sort of thing. But how is your bot going to influence my bot through APIs? This is a fundamentally different competitive world, isn't it? Yeah, it is, absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's fair to say that we're at the beginning of a journey here. And we are using bots today. Um, with, we've got a service called Assist, um, where the customers can basically chat, and they'll chat to a bot. Um, and that's, that's the first stage. Can I, just, yep. can I just ask one quick question about yep. that? Maybe it's because I'm old, I don't know. I much prefer accessing chat bots than, than ringing up. 
Because when you, when you talk to the little chatbot thing, on, you, know, you get the transcript and you can remember what you were supposed to do. And what you, I much prefer chatbots to talking to a real human being. Who prefers talking to a real human being? Well, so there's one or two perverts, frankly. Out there, <laughs> but for most people, the best service, and actually we don't care if the chatbot is, a, I don't care if it's a person or an AI, I don't care. A chatbot is a much better way to interface about complex matters. The customers like it. I think that's debatable. Um, I, I think for um, simple, innocuous things, you know, what's my balance? How do I do this? Can I order something? Can, you know, can I arrange something? Yes, I think that, that is simple. If it's a much more complicated thing, then, you know, for example, if, if, if you're registering a death, for example, you don't really want to deal with a bot there. You want to speak to a human being. Um, if it's a complaint, you want to speak to a human. You want to make sure and that that's understood. Um, but, but, but the services, I think, in terms of bots will mature. But to get back to the point that you were making at the beginning, I think we'll also evolve to this world where the customer will have a bot that is talking to the bank bot uh, in order to find the best service or the best product for them. That, that, that will happen. But the kind of service that the bank offers then will be entirely different because it doesn't need to be polite anymore. Right? It doesn't need to um, pretend to be human. You just want to have a bot that gives you the fullest uh, yeah. set of information and allows you also through, through an API to also ultimately open up an account as well. But that's a different relationship, product. right? But, but aren't we in the danger of, of starting to talk about sci-fi and innovation theatre before we've even got the basics RBS right? RBS is a real bank. I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking specifically about RBS. I'm talking about the, the, the concept of bots talking to bots. And like, that's, that's great, right? But there are some really simple things that I can't do today that need to be implemented. And the pace, this, back to this pace of change thing, don't talk to me about the sci-fi until I can do some of the fundamentals um, and do those seamlessly and easily, like opening an account, you know, something as simple as that. It would be beautiful if I could do that in you know, seconds and minutes and not days and hours and going down to, to branches. So there is a place on the roadmap for the bots and the, the sci-fi, but let's, let's get some of the fundamentals right first. Okay, let me ask you another question then about the practical sort of implications of this sort of thing, which again touches on what you guys have just said about the apps. I, I mean, I agree with what Alan's saying about API-based competition. I agree with what you're saying about people being slightly more promiscuous through apps, because my suspicion is they may not even know which bank is providing the service. But a lot of people are talking about the kind of rebundling of financial services because of this. So you said your mother goes to the bank and gets everything from the bank, right? But you presumably have already seen this because of the way Klarna works. Mm -hmm. So in this kind of new world where the app on my phone, where, so for example, I might download the Saga financial services app and the Saga financial services app connects to all the banks and whatever and, it do, and I'm quite happy to let it just run and do things for me. But now I have insurance from one bank, I have a mortgage from another bank, I have a current account from another bank, I have a savings account from another bank, and it's no hassle whatsoever to me because it's all, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the way that people think about financial services and the way they distribute that trust, that, that must change under those circumstances. Yeah, I think so. And I think that you know, what we're uh, really focused on is, is in-context uh, lending, so making decisions around... Uh, giving consumers access to, to finance well, as they're shopping or uh, you know, as they're going through making decisions around making purchases. So you know, getting access to uh, more data to improve the relevance of those lending decisions. Oh, I understand. So basically I go to Amazon, I go to check out the big TV. Amazon says, do you want to pay for this now or do you want to pay for it over 12 months? You have a quick look at my LinkedIn to see if I'm up for it. If you think I'm a good credit risk, you'll lend me the money. If you think I'm a bad credit risk, you pass me off to the bank. Is that broadly? Yeah, so we're... Yeah, so we're, so. we're, we're <laughs> no, no, I mean, we're all in business. We understand how these things work. Yeah, so what, what we're interested in is, is getting access to data that makes yeah. us more relevant to, to making those lending decisions, to empower the consumer to, uh, to, to be able to get access to, to finance to, to make purchases. So... Um, yeah, from that, that perspective, um, yeah, that's, that's what enables us and we see as enabling us to become more relevant to the consumer. Because at the end of the day, 
Uh, you know, this, is the, this journey that we're going on is about empowering consumers to get control over their finances and to, uh, to decide how they share information to financial institutions. And ultimately, for us to be able to make more informed decisions around lending so that uh, you know, they can uh, get access to what's, what's right uh, at their, as they're transacting. But you all want this data, right? So that means, because, I mean, whether it's for lending or other things, you all want all of this data. So that kind of implies that once we've opened up these APIs, I mean, this is just the information APIs, never mind payment APIs. Once we can get hold of all of that information, then all of a sudden the emphasis shifts because now it's not who provides good service, as we were talking about, it's who's got the best data scientists, mm. who's got the best clouds, who's got the best machine learning, who's got, because the, the amount of data these things could slurp up through the APIs is, is gigantic. It's, it's, not your, it's not your bank manager having a quick look at how much you've got in the other bank, right? This is machines hoovering up these massive amounts of data through these APIs. Yeah, Isn't look, it? I think you can say no. I don't take it personally. It's <laughs> like if you. Well, I, I guess um, for me, it's, it, it's, it, we shouldn't obsess about what we can do with those mandatory APIs. To your point earlier, the the uh, the, the quadrant. I think the interesting thing is is how you combine those APIs with other microservices in order to create interesting end user propositions. Yeah, our focus in, in, on our Thinkit platform is to create an environment where those APIs and microservices are accessible and useful to a developer community, whether that's inside the bank or outside the bank with the bank's permission, so that we can start combining the services that are available inside the bank with those of our partners, with those that we create ourselves, so that we can enable new types of customer experiences. Um, if we focus just on how can I take that one API and suck data out of it, we're missing a massive opportunity to create new experiences. So who, so just give us an example of what other, so when you say other people then, so what, what other kind of people would you connect this data to? Is like uh, health insurers in case you, like if there's too much donuts or whatever on your account? Or? Um, I guess my example is not about connecting the data to them, it's combining the microservices together. So can I take um, access to product information, access to account information, combine that with an identity service provider, combine that um, with a secure card storage, and use that, uh, combine it perhaps with a communication service provider and create a new application. For example, um, you know, a service that knows when I'm going overseas and helps me um, manage my cards and access my account information. But the one API on its own isn't enough to create a compelling service. It has yes. to be the combination. That is a simple example of saying, because again, I won't mention my bank, but I was in the US a few weeks ago and my, my card was declined at an ATM because I was in the US. It happens all the time. Yeah, and so they rang me up at four o'clock in the morning to ask me, because that's 9 a.m. in the UK. Yeah. And so they rang me up at 4 o'clock in the morning to confirm that I was in the US. You think, well, can't, well, that's back to can't fixing you tell the from the app? That yeah. is back to fixing the fundamentals. Every person I've spoken to about that example um, recognizes it and has experienced it themselves. Now, There's what you need to things. solve that problem is a card storage, a communication channel, whether that's SMS push notification or a chat service. You need uh, a location service. You, you need a combination of APIs. You need an environment that developers can access those APIs to develop great end user propositions. But let's solve genuine customer problems and not the, the theater in the future. All right, let, let's finish up by moving back towards the big picture again then. So we've, we've gone down into the APIs and different kind of APIs, the new kinds of competition, the fact that bank has to restructure, what this means for apps. And, but I give the audience the sense of the big picture around this sort of stuff. So is it that... Uh, banks have um, a, a renewal through this process because they can access this other data. Um, is it that some banks will actually opt merely to be the pipes and actually give up on the front end? Is it that some banks will actually just partner with or buy the fintechs to provide the front ends and they'll sit at the back end? Uh, is it that new players will come into this space and use the data in ways that it's difficult for the incumbents to use and so on and so forth? Can you just finish by giving the audience a little sense of what you think the big picture is? We'll start with Nick at the far end. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a combination, right? So let me start with um, the customer-centric view. So I would like to see the established banks break the digital transformation gridlock that they're in and start to be able to innovate at speed and create new services and reduce the cost of change. 
Um, and if they do that, I think they've got a really great chance of continuing to be um, the primary place where people go to for their financial services. That's one scenario, and I can see that playing out if they focus on building great services, but changing their platform, their processes, and their culture in order to achieve that. Another scenario is, is that you can be um, an awesome dump pipe. And by that I mean is that, yes, you have to make available um, your APIs, but do that in a way in which you make available the non-mandatory ones as well, and those of partners and other providers, and put them in an environment where other innovators and developers can access them to create great services. It's API-based competition, basically. In yeah, and those yeah. are the sort of two, two ends of the spectrum. Celine. Uh, I'm very bad to uh, see the future, so I will give you more food for thought um, about the French market. Uh, we were talking recently about uh, the fact that uh, banks lose the uh, relationship with users in the, the last mile. Uh, we have seen a couple of interesting moves on the French market. Uh, Credit Mutual Arca bought us uh, mainly for the relationship we have with customers, 7 million on uh, Litchi 2000. Uh, um, platform working with Mangopay. Um, last week, BNP Paribas bought uh, Conte Nickel, that is uh, roughly a competitor of uh, Revolut on number 26. Uh, we have also seen uh, BPC buying Fidor. Um, and in all this uh, relationship between bank and startup, the question was always, uh, we buy the relationship you have with customers. And for all these examples, they've all chosen to let uh, the fintech stay very independent and uh, make their own day-to-day uh, -day and not integration. So letting the fintech, uh, keeping the relationship and the knowledge on how to address user and maybe provide more technology, yeah. financials, of course. So APIs for efficiency, but still a relationship based. Yeah. Uh, Alan, what's your general feeling? I think... Um, <clears throat> We shouldn't run away from the policy objective here of the regulators at the European level and Her Majesty's Treasury. They want to tilt the playing field and create far more competition, and that will happen. That's going to happen, right? Bank, banks didn't decide to do open banking because they thought it was a good idea, right? It, it, the regulators are saying, thou shalt, and so we need to make it so. So let's, let, let's not beat about the bush and just, just face up to that. So ultimately, I think the greatest winner here is going to be the consumer, because I think there will be greater competition, so there'll be less cost, and there'll be a greater range of services. So I think that's good. I think the very interesting question for all of us in this industry is, how are we going to, because, because the landscape is changing, there's tectonic plate movements, that we cannot stop, the forces are inexorable. So how can we take advantage of this for ourselves and for our customers, keep customers safe? Obviously, we didn't talk about security today, but that's a whole new subject that's going to get very interesting with multiple players and so on. Um, so it, it, it creates a tremendous opportunity, I think, both for fintech startups that are so um, innovative, so many ideas, and it also creates a huge opportunity for incumbents as well in terms of how they're going to adjust rapidly, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, to, to really take advantage um, in, in, uh, as, as things change and before it, it settles again. So, Luke, I assume this is really good news for you, but, but what do you feel about the bigger picture? So, I, I think the, uh, the overriding uh, feeling I have is, one, is actually one of excitement because uh, we've seen how you know, fintechs have innovated and the opening up and the, um, the creation of a, an environment which is, is going to bring in more competition is ultimately only going to be good for the consumer. Um, and I think the, that really the banks, we now need to get to a, a place where it's m much more about opportunity and uh, cooperation rather than competition uh, between fintechs and banks. It's now how can those fintechs add value to the bank's customers um, and, and vice versa. Um, and it's, you know, ultimately, that's a good thing for the customer. It's a very good thing. Listen, guys, thank you very much for sharing honest opinions with me and with all of the audience here. We genuinely appreciate it. Thank you very much.